In this module, we're going to discuss some aspects of the Roman imperial economy in an effort to highlight some key topics that relate to the way the empire's economy functioned and also to highlight some of its uh, high points as well as some of the things that led to its ultimate collapse. We should start by pointing out that by the time of the Emperor Augustus, the Roman economy was fully monetized utilizing hard currency as a medium of exchange. You see here um, the coin denominations at the time of Augustus, where the top level coin valuation is a gold coin known as the aureus, equivalent in value to 25 denarii, often a silver coin, equivalent to 100 sestertii, often a bronze coin, equivalent to 400 as a small denomination bronze coin. Coinage as a medium of exchange became important increasingly in the Roman world over the course of the latter part of the first millennium BC. But we can say a lot about the Roman economy even before monetization came about. Earliest areas of exchange at Rome are in the areas known as the Forum Boarium, the cattle market, and the Forum Politorium, the vegetable market, green market at the river harbor of the city on the river Tiber. In the areas of Forum, the Forum Boarium and the Forum Holitorium, shops, sanctuaries, and eventually warehouses known as Horia uh, grew up over the course of the first millennium BC. This area remained uh, mercantile in its nature throughout Roman antiquity. The Roman Forum itself, the Forum Romanum, also was a place for exchange since it was the multi-purpose civic center, a place for politics, religion, commerce, and entertainment. And we have evidence for shops, purpose-built shops, showing up in the Roman Forum in the third and second centuries BC. The so-called tabernae septem, meaning the seven shops, it burned into ten, were placed in various phases down to the tabernae noai, the new shops, in 193 BC. These shops flanked the central forum square. A taberna generally is a small stall, often installed in the portico of a larger building, as you see here in this example of some imperial tabernae at Rome. Now, this structure, built under the reign of Julius Caesar, stood on two levels with shops on both uh, level one and level two. In the early 2nd century AD, the Emperor Trajan, responsible for a project that we call the Markets of Trajan, a large mercantile hall, a hemicycle in design, with shops and offices for merchants, traders, government officials on multiple levels. The city of Pompeii, owing to its destruction uh, by Mount Vesuvius, shows us a lot of well-preserved evidence for shops in situ, which we don't see anywhere else. You see here a typical street front in Pompeii with shops here opening onto the street. Uh, you notice painted advertisements still on the walls. Um, uh, 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 the shop here at left is a sort of quick foods shop known as a thermopolium belonging to an individual called Azelina. Here, the painted advertisements on the right of a baker shop in Pompeii, at left, terracotta plaques advertising the place of business of a tool maker, blacksmith. Uh, um, uh, 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 so you can see different kinds of occupations here. Larger markets lumped under the name of Machellum, this is the Machellum at Pompeii, a market for buying fresh foods, especially fresh proteins, meats, and fish. The Machellum here is uh, uh, organized around a central open courtyard with stalls going round, opening onto the forum on this side. Having open markets, such as the Machellum, requires government regulation to make sure that weights and measures are standardized and that fraud is minimized. You see here a weights and measure table from uh, Roman North Africa, 
with three different standards of length measurement, the Punic cubit, the Roman foot, and the Ptolemaic cubit. We don't have any accurate data on how much fraud uh, was um, at work in the Roman economy, but it certainly was there, the potential was there, and local magistrates attempt to regulate um, both uh, uh, weights and measures, dry and liquid. At Rome, we can look to uh, evidence from coins and inscriptions for a large market known as the Macellum Magnum, the Great Market, that was built um, under the Emperor Nero, dating to um, the year 59. And these kinds of markets uh, for fresh provisions would be very important in um, uh, a bustling, crowded metropolis like the city of Rome. Again, like Pompeii, we think that the Michelin Magnum here has an exterior portico with a central open courtyard. If we go to Ostia, the commercial city at the mouth of the River Tiber, through which a lot of Rome's um, imported goods were transported, we see a structure known as the Forum of the Corporation standing behind the theater complex. Here we see the Forum of the Corporations, square portico, uh, a mercantile portico, in that each stall round the uh, three sides of the portico occupied by some kind of commercial operation. You can see a, sh uh, a view of the portico as it is today, small shops or offices for doing business. By looking at the mosaic pavements that survive in the form of the corporations, we see evidence of um, different trades and different resident foreign traders who um, uh, did business here. Here we see uh, an inscription in the mosaic that mentions one Clodius Primigenius and uh, Claudius Crescens. They are uh, stupatores, meaning that they trade in rope and in flax. Another very famous one uh, from the form of the corporations is this uh, mosaic showing an elephant. Up here above the elephant, it says statio, the station, the place of the Sabrathans, Sabratha, a, a city in Libya and North Africa. These individuals probably involved in trading wild animals and also perhaps ivory. For comparison's sake, think of your local farmer's market or street market. For instance, this is the Campo dei Fiori, a modern um, weekday market in the city of Rome where uh, merchants set up their booths early in the day, stay through um, mid-afternoon, usually selling everything from coffee pots, to fresh fruits and vegetables, to spices. This is the nature of the, the periodic market in, uh, in the Roman world. Sometimes periodic markets would happen in a fixed location all the time, like the Campo dei Fiori here in the slide. Other times they would move around according to a schedule that would be known so that people, both sellers and buyers, could know when and where the market was happening. The Roman economy, by and large, is very healthy throughout the uh, beginnings uh, centuries of the imperial period. It's very robust, it grows quickly. One problem that does begin to creep in by the late first century AD is inflation. Inflation, a term, of course, uh, still uh, something we worry about in uh, our economy, uh, essentially where prices outstrip the value of the item. Inflationary uh, spirals can be deadly in economic terms, and Rome was experiencing very uh, bad, very high rates of inflation, such that by the time we get to the Emperor Diocletian, who reigns between 284 and 305 AD, um, inflation is really quite out of control. And Diocletian makes an effort to address the inflationary problem it's a noble effort. Perhaps it comes a bit too late. Diocletian's strategy is to try to control prices by officially mandating or fixing 
prices, issuing the price edict of Diocletian, the edict of maximum prices. You see a preserved fragment of that inscription here, uh, drawn up in the late third century AD. This uh, was an attempt to correct the inflationary problem, which had been caused, or started at least, by debasing coinage. Roman coinage in the beginning was based on the inherent value. The amount of gold equaled the value of the coin. Well, if you alter the quantity of gold and replace some of the gold with something less valuable, the coin itself becomes devalued, debased. And this eventually erodes confidence in the coinage, makes buyers and sellers less sure about the value of that medium of exchange. Diocletian's strategy in, in summary form was to standardize prices and standardize exchange rates, hoping this would even out the uh, inflationary problem. It unfortunately only had so much of an impact. Inflationary problems were already out of control, and the instability in the Roman economy in the 3rd, 4th, uh, and 5th centuries AD is one of the primary factors that leads to the eventual collapse uh, of the Western Empire. This is um, a sure sign that an out-of-control economic system eventually will cause problems for uh, uh, political systems in a larger sense. One of the interesting things about the Roman economy is its scale. The city of Rome which had topped more likely than not a total population of a million people in the time of Augustus, had a lot of needs. It needed lots of food and supplies and fresh water, such that no uh, previous ancient city had seen an economic need at this scale before. The Romans then need to uh, manage, and in some cases invent, appropriately scaled systems of supply to meet the demand. Rome is upriver from the Mediterranean, about 22 kilometers upriver on the Tiber, which means that a lot of transshipment has to happen. Italy is not capable of producing enough food to support the city of Rome, uh, especially in terms of producing grain, which is a primary food source. This means that most grain has to be imported from Sicily and or North Africa. This means ocean-going ships have to bring the grain to Italy. The grain has to be unloaded from the ocean-going ships into warehouses on the, on the land, eventually then transferred from the warehouse to river boats and taken upriver to uh, Rome for use and distribution. You see a, a theoretical reconstruction of such an operation at Ostia loading supplies onto a flat-bottom river boat to go off the river to Rome. The scale is really quite mind-blowing. We know that um, every year about 60 million modii, a modius being a measurement of grain, reach the city of Rome. In other words, that means 1,200 large seagoing vessels carrying about 350 tons of grain on average came to Rome every year. We have to keep in mind that there's only about a hundred days for uh, river sailing where the river is going to be cooperative. That means about 17 ships per day have to be unloaded and uh, transshipped up up the river. This is really uh, an impressive scale of um, uh, economic activity. Another major product that's coming in to um, the port of Ostia and being transshipped to Rome is olive oil. About 20 million liters of olive oil there per year. Wine, about 100 million liters. That's 4 million amphorae, 4 million wine containers. Um, if we're going to talk about these in man size loads, the loads that a porter can carry, we're talking about 9.3 million porter loads. All of this in a sailing season of about 100 days, from April through September. Um, the, the, the scale here is, is, is really impressive. 
when products were unloaded from the ocean-going ships, they were typically stored, at least temporarily, in warehouses. The word for a warehouse, singular, horium. You see the ground plan of several warehouses at Ostia here. Um, these horia uh, um, were important points in the transshipment of, of products. And the scale of this economic system shows us that there also is imperial regulation, imperial control, uh, especially of things like grain and olive oil. You see here a ramp preserved in one of the horia, leading to what would have been an upper level. So it's important to keep transportation in mind um, in terms of uh, seeing how um, things move around. We have various transportation means. Land transport uh, is not very effective in that it's expensive. It adds a lot of time and difficulty. It's not a very efficient means. So seaborne transport is really much preferred. It cuts down on time. It cuts down on expense. There is risk. Seagoing is risky. Uh, but the cost-benefits analysis shows that um, Sea transport is really the way to go. This means that we see a number of types of boats. Scafa, Lintres, and Lenunculi are all types of river-going boats, row boats. Um, for instance, at Ostia, there are at least five guilds, five professional associations of Lenuncularii. Those are row boat men. At Ostia, around 192, the inscription records 258 members. We also see specific uh, typed river boats, the Nawes Codicarii, these can carry a load of 70 tons each. You see an example from Roman Germany of um, a riverboat here hauling what we usually presume to be kegs of beer um, there on the, um, uh, on the ship with the, the oarsmen there, um, the helmsmen there at the back. A lot of Roman shipping hugs the coast. A typical two-masted coastal boat, a corbita, you see here in this small relief for small loads. And then we have big ocean-going ships that take things across um, long distances. For instance, the route from Alexandria and Egypt to um, the western coast of Italy, putting in either at the Bay of Naples or at the port uh, near Ostia. Now, how about uh, transactions at the personal level? Well, again, if we turn to Pompeii, we get some evidence that we don't really see anywhere else. A set of um, documents we call the Murasine tablets, a set of uh, about 70 formerly wax tablets that were discovered in 1959 um, near Pompeii's River Harbor um, that were carbonized in the um, uh, eruption of Vesuvius. This belongs to a group, uh, or these tablets rather, belong to a group of moneylenders. And we see evidence, for instance, here that they are um, making loans in various amounts, from very small loans up to very big loans, from as little as one sesterce up to 100,000. One of the documents shows a patron working to help his client secure a loan. We see some names of traders that we can identify at the site of Puteoli, further up north around the Bay of Naples. Many of the individuals who are borrowing were freedmen, that is, former slaves, or have names that indicate that they had a formerly servile status, for instance, Fortunatus, the lucky one. And some tablets have SOL, salutus, discharged, or a diagonal hash mark, a diagonal line through them, indicating the loan has been either canceled or paid back. So these are the kinds of loan records that your bank in 2015 might well keep. We also have interesting evidence from uh, another site in Pompeii, the house of uh, a famous Roman known as Lucius Caecilius Jucundus, who lived from about AD 20 until about AD 62. <clears throat> Caecilius's house is partially preserved uh, in the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. It's a very nice, well-appointed house. But what's of interest to us here is uh, financial records, financial documents recovered by archaeologists in their excavation of Caecilius's house. And these documents provide um, 
important information for us about Caecilius' job as a money lender. He himself was the son of a freedman, um, but had become quite wealthy. And in his house, we have at least 153 uh, preserved wax tablets that include financial records, bookkeeping. 137 of these records indicate that they were advances, cash advances for auctions. Many tablets, many documents have the names of witnesses, just as if you were borrowing money today. Someone witnesses the, um, the contract. And the tablets specify the repayment terms, whether the loan needs to be repaid in as little as a few months or as long as a year from the date of borrowing. And some of the tablets record the names of known uh, Pompeian aristocrats, which is very interesting that they're borrowing money in the first place. Here's one example, um, an interesting example, because it, it shows us a woman borrowing money, a woman called Umbricia Januaria, who declared that she had received from Lucius Caecilius Jucundus the sum of 11,039 sesterces, which is um, a tidy sum of money. This is an auction proceed and uh, um, showing that the loan has been settled uh, with Caecilius. And we see here the date, 12th day of December, giving us the year, con the consulship, consulship of Lucius Duvius and Publius Clodius, and then various witnesses who um, witness the transaction. So the um, financial records of the Murasign tablets and those from Caecilius' house show us another uh, element of scale, the individual scale in the Roman economy. Taken all together, we see a lot of very Im interesting information that survives telling us about how the economy functioned, what was important. Um, it gives us a lot to think about, and especially as we think about the economic crisis that necessitated Diocletian's um, creation of the Edict of Maximum Prices, we get some sense of how um, the Roman world runs on the economy, and that the economy is central to the mechanism that makes the empire a successful and um, long-enduring political endeavor.